Papers lately, some go through the water. And some, some of us go through the flood. Some go through the fire. But we all go through. Has anybody been through? Somebody say, but God, but God, but God yeah. gives us a song that even in the night season and all the day Just keep that going right there one more time. Some through the water. Yeah. Hey, some. Some of us have to go through the flood. That's all right. Some through the fire. But everybody got. first month of the year, but here has anybody been through great sorrow? Anybody been through great sorrow? Just help have yourself. you been through great sorrow? I've got good news, but God, yeah. but God, yeah. but God, he gives a song, Mama. and it's in your night season you may be in your night season you may be a preacher or an elected official in your night season you may be in your night season but oh that's all right Help yourself. That's all right. 
Somebody. That's all right. That's all right. Let us pray. Father God, it is the entrance of thy word that brings light and life. We pray your precious and anointed word and the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ will shine. Hide me behind your empty cross. Decrease me and increase thee. May the people be blessed by thee and never impressed by me. It is through the glorious light of thy salvation that thy word to cause people to see thee more clearly, to love thee more dearly, to follow thee more nearly. Now, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh, Lord, my rock and my redeemer, and every glad heart said amen. amen. To the pastor of this old ship of Zion, the Reverend Jesse Williams, to the officers and members and friends of this great church, to the president of this great minister's conference, of greater New York and vicinity, my brother in the ministry, Reverend James Morrison, and to my sister in Christ, the Reverend Anita Burson, who has helped to provide some of the wind beneath my wings. to Reverend John Scott, who knew me before I knew myself. And to my dear friend and brother, for whom I call a smooth operator, Congressman Charlie Rangel. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. to the mayor and the comptroller, to the district attorney, Cyrus Vance, and to the borough president, to the police department of the city of New York, to the council members who may be present, to our dear brother and longtime friend, Stuart Applebaum. To my fellow clergy, ministers, and pulpit associates. To the pulpitors. To the beautiful music from the musicians. And to all my black and white, young and old, rich and poor, male and female, brethren and sisters in the cause for freedom, justice, and equality for all mankind, I greet you in the name of my Heavenly Father, and my Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It is indeed an honor and privilege to address this most august and distinguished body of individuals on this historic occasion. As we celebrate the life, work, and sacrifices of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement, I'm here today standing on the shoulders of many nameless foot soldiers 
that made the sacrifices possible for us to be here today with all rights and privileges afforded to us as human beings of the planet. It didn't used to be that way a long time ago. But for those of you who don't know who I am, I am the son of the best friend, partner, chief strategist, and closest associate to Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Reverend Ralph David Abernathy, Sr. I was fortunate, Congressman, to have grown up in the Civil Rights Movement under the tutelage and shoulders of my father and Uncle Martin. I affectionately called Dr. King Uncle Martin and his wife Aunt Coretta. And the King children called my father Uncle Ralph and my mother Aunt Juanita. We all grew up together. We integrated our elementary schools and our high schools. I was the running back and Dexter was the blocker. And through our years at Spring Street Elementary School, we were the only two black kids in the whole conference. And we never lost a game. I participated as a child in almost every major march for freedom of our people and was arrested at the age of nine in 1968. Governor Lester Maddox arrested 67 of us for marching on a mule train from Marks, Mississippi to Washington, D.C., fighting for freedom, justice, and equality at the nation's Poor People's Campaign. Later in that same state of Georgia, I became a state senator, where I served for 10 years, and they arrested me again for $5,700 on a state Senate expense account. Lunch money and gasoline money made it a crime and convicted me and sentenced me to 10 years with four to serve. I'll always remember what my mother told me that day that they sentenced me and off to prison immediately I went. And mama looked at me and said, Ralph, don't worry. What man means for bad, God makes for good. They sent me to prison, and five years later, they brought up questions of the governor's expense account. And they conveniently found, Charlie, a 1969 Attorney General ruling that states that money paid to state officials for their expenses is part of their gross income. And so they let the governor go on $130,000 of his expense account that he had pocketed from the mansion expense account, and they sent me to jail for 5700 They thought they were breaking me, but they were making me. And Mama was right. I met Jesus for myself one day in a, a lonely Georgia prison cell. And he lifted me up above my circumstances in the midst of my despair and carried me through my valley with his love and his care. They bombed our home before I was born with my mother in it, pregnant with my oldest sister, Wandelin, and Donzele, two years old in the crib. The house is now on the historic register of national places at Alabama State University campus. And I grew up going to bed with the fear that they were going to bomb my room 
thinking they were hitting mom and daddy's room. And so I negotiated with my mother to keep a light on in the hall and the door cracked. They dynamited my father's church, the First Baptist Church of Montgomery, and they sold all of my father's possessions at public auction for leading the fight against racism in Montgomery, Alabama. They threatened his life and the life of his family for walking side by side with his best friend and closest associate, Martin Luther King Jr. Every time King went to jail, Abernathy went to jail with him. Every time there was a mass meeting in the country and King spoke, Abernathy spoke. They were the dynamic duo. Abernathy spoke the strategy and King spoke the philosophy. Abernathy told us what we were going to do, when we were going to do it, and how we were going to do it. And King told us why we were going to do it. They have separated them in death where they were inseparable in life. And you can hardly find a picture where the two men were not together. And today they barely call Abernathy's name. Abernathy was King's mentor in Montgomery, his best friend in the world, his partner in the movement. King wouldn't make a move without Abernathy's advice. They called themselves the civil rights twins. Abernathy got the first call from the local chapter president, E.D. Nixon, after Rosa was arrested. And Abernathy organized the first meeting which turned into the Montgomery bus boycott and the civil rights movement. And on that fateful day on April the 4th, 1968, they shared the same room at the Lorraine Motel. And if you go there, it's a museum now, and in that room, you'll see two beds. One was Dr. Abernathy's, and the other one was Dr. King. And on that day, they had an understanding between the two of them that whoever took the longest to get dressed would get dressed first. And it took my daddy an hour to shave. And so he was on the balcony first, waiting on Uncle Martin. And when Uncle Martin came out, he smelled Uncle Martin's Aramis cologne. And he said, Martin, I forgot to put on my Aramis. Martin said, Ralph, I'll be out here on the balcony waiting on you. And when he heard the firecracker shots, as he put the cologne in his hand, he rushed to the front, and Uncle Martin was lying there in front of the room door. The first person that got up from the ground was Andy, and he looked and said, oh, no, it's over, it's over. And Daddy said, Martin, shut up and go get some towels, yeah, yeah. because he didn't want Uncle Martin to hear that. And so Bernard Lee, Martin Luther King's assistant refused to let anybody go in the ambulance but Dr. Abernathy. As they rushed Uncle Martin to the hospital, and Daddy said he committed civil disobedience when he refused to leave the operating room as they worked on him, and they worked on him. And then finally they came over and said, there's no more we can do for him. And my father went over and cradled him in his arms as he took his last breath. And it was Abernathy who King chose to succeed him. He knew Abernathy had the courage and commitment 
to the cause for freedom and the work they had started. You see, Martin had Ralph, but Ralph didn't have a Ralph. But Martin knew Ralph had the courage to walk alone and provide the leadership necessary to finish the civil rights movement that we all benefit from today, the food stamp programs, the affirmative action, labor laws, free lunch program for low-income children, the peace settlement for Native Americans, and joining forces with the Latin American movement with Cesar Chavez and the immigrant farm workers. And today, they barely call his name or recognize the importance of that dynamic duo. They can give Bobby Kennedy to John and even give Ed McMahon to Johnny Carson. King and Abernathy were partners to history. And today, some would rather relegate Abernathy to one of King's lieutenants. And King is turning over in his grave and put Abernathy on the level of a staff, when in fact lieutenants came into the movement after the formation of SCLC, and they were paid staff members, the only persons who never received a paycheck from the work of the organization of SCLC and the civil rights movement was King and Abernathy. They were partners, what cannot be denied should not be ignored. Mark, the sixth chapter, the seventh verse says, and he called the 12 together, and he gave them power over unclean spirits, and he sent them out two by two. They were driven by something greater than themselves. The Selma movie got it wrong. The Selma movie mischaracterizes the legacy and contributions of two of the three most significant people in the African-American African -American's right to vote, RDA and LBJ. Selma represents a missed opportunity to show the truth of unity in our community and tell the truth of how black and white people work together to accomplish the gains of the civil rights movement. And more particularly, our nation's president strategizing with King and Abernathy for our right to vote. Instead, this movie misleads young people and mischaracterizes the truth. It is obvious Oprah Winfrey's intentions were not to make a good movie as much as it was to make good money and perhaps receive an Oscar rather than to tell a true story and leave a positive blueprint for our young generation, born and unborn. Isaiah 29, 13, the Lord says, These people who come near to me with their lips and honor me with their mouth, but their hearts are far from me. The truth, and only the truth, will set you free. Martin Luther King Jr. went to the White House with Ralph David Abernathy. They strategized together with President Lyndon Bain Johnson, their plan of action. James Bevel was not the chief strategist, bright and brilliant, but eccentric. And Martin and Ralph did not follow Bevel as betrayed in the movie. Bevel followed them. And Bevel spent his last years in prison for child molestation of his daughters. And Oprah wants America to believe that Martin Luther King Jr. followed a child molester. What a disrespectful way to give honor to a man who gave his life 
in order for Oprah and director Ava DuVoy to have an opportunity to make a movie about civil rights and get paid for it. If you're going to do a movie about such an important event in American history, why not consult the widow of Dr. Ralph David Abernathy, Martin's best friend and closest associate, for advice as to who did what. Instead of allowing the individual paid staff members to determine who played what roles. There's something dark about not recognizing the light of the truth of God. There were those within the organization who tried to undermine King's leadership, who some are still alive today, but couldn't because they couldn't compromise Abernathy's. Abernathy was the backbone of the civil rights movement. King was the neck bone. King's greatest supporter was his best friend. And on January 15, 1969, a year after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., his best friend, Ralph David Abernathy, declared as the new leader on January 15th, a national people's holiday. In 1968, just four days after the death of King, Congressman John Conyers introduced the King Holiday Bill. It failed. Abernathy started a petition drive that resulted in 800,000 signatures for its passage. He traveled to Washington and personally presented the petition to President Nixon, but to no avail. Conyers reintroduced the bill in 1971. And Senator Ed Brooke did the same in the Senate. This time, Abernathy launched a petition drive to secure more than 3 million signatures and personally brought them to the White House. And Conyers and 24 other House members, I'm sure Charlie Rangel was in the number, <laughs> met with 25 mayors, yes, sir. urging them to make their own proclamations and make their own January 15th celebration. Thereafter, by the time the final passage of the bill, 14 states had legally established January 15th as a national holiday. These are some of the contributions and sacrifices that my family have made for black people and for all people in America. But rather, they show blacks against one another. The light-skinned against the dark-skinned the house Negro against the field Negro, when much of that was a lie. You see, it was the house Negro that told the field Negro when to steal away to freedom. We had to be together to come this far by faith, leaning on his everlasting arms. Let us tell the true story so that our young people will have the true blueprint and know the truth. The word of God says the truth and only the truth will set you free. Congressman Rangel, I hope that you can help the mayor and city councilman to name a street in honor of my father right here in Holland. These two men came together with no jealousy and no envy. In the spirit of love, changed the course of history in the world. There will never be another Martin Luther King, Jr., 
until there's another Ralph David Abernathy. They had a date with destiny and a rendezvous with, a rendezvous with eternity. It would be most befitting to name a street in this great city to honor my father. Perhaps that may intersect with Martin Luther King Jr. An intersection that represents nonviolence, justice, and the redemptive spirit of love these two men stood for. Right here in New York City, a city so nice they named it twice. You see, God sent Martin to Montgomery to hook up with Ralph. Rosa sat so Ralph and Martin could walk. They walked so Barack could run. He ran so we can fly and the sky be the limit. The movement for social change is in my blood. And as a child, I watched a small group of freedom fighters committed to nonviolence and Christian love laid down as a way of life by Jesus of Nazareth. They didn't get it from Bernard or Bayard Rustin. They got it from Jesus Christ of Nazareth. These were two men of God, made operative in the 20th century by Mahatma Gandhi, as he freed a whole nation of people from colossal domination and exploitation, and then made to live in our time by Ralph David Abernathy and Martin Luther King, and the great people of the South, Montgomery, Mississippi, South Carolina, North Carolina, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, who sacrificed tired feet for restless souls and discovered that a walk for freedom was better than a segregated ride. Yeah. It's been 55 years since the Montgomery bus boycott. It's been 40 years since the march on Washington. Been 40 plus years since the Brown versus the Board of Education. Been 50 years since Selma and Mississippi and the Voting Rights Act. It's been 47 years since Memphis. Been 48 years since the nation's poor people's campaign. Been 49 years since the Charleston Hospital Workers' Strike. It's been six years since the election of the first black president. And the biggest talk around town is how it appears the clock of time is turning back on our people. From Ferguson, Mississippi, Missouri, to New York, where do we go from here? The question remains, where do we go from here? Because inasmuch as things seem to change, they still remain the same. They've been killing young black men for hundreds of years. And we are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Because of the major gains we accomplished in the 60s and 70s for civil rights, women are free, gay people are free, Hispanic and Latin American people are free. African American people are free and my president is black. And now we feel that we have arrived at our destination of freedom. But we're still not free. Freedom is not just simply the right to do as you please. Freedom is when it pleases you to do what is right. It's more than physical, it's spiritual, it's psychological, it's psychosocial. What good is it to be physically free and mentally enslaved? Change on the brain. Some people want us to think that 
This race for equality is over, and equality is achieved because we got a black man on a white house. The battle is won. This race ain't over, and we have not won. This race is not a sprint or a 40-yard dash. This is a relay race. And some people who finished the race dropped the baton and got paid for running the race and didn't bother to pass the baton on to the next generation. For so long, we've asked ourselves, the keepers of the dream. Is the dream deferred? Is the dream denied? Is the dream dead? No, they kill the dreamer, but not the dream. You see, the problem we face today is a dream occurs in the midst of a human condition called sleep. A dream is a healthy occurrence and a normal state of rest. However, scientific studies show that sleep, which occurs longer than a certain period of time, is clinically referred to as a coma. This state can turn a normal dream into a nightmare. The dream is a nightmare when kids 7,000 drop out of high school every day, one every 26 seconds, and they have no high school diploma. The dream is a nightmare when a vast number of African Americans live in poverty. They have no money, and in America, money talks, and they ain't got nothing to say. The dream is a nightmare when 70% of our nation's population are disproportionately African-American males between the ages of 18 and 35, and 98% of them don't have a high school diploma. There's a direct correlation between no education. It equals incarceration. If you, if you want to stay out of prison, stay in school. If you don't graduate from high school, you will graduate from the prison industrial complex. The dream is a nightmare when African Americans are the biggest consumers, spending roughly $600 billion a year but can't get adequate banking, decent grocery stores in our neighborhoods, housing or community development projects in our neighborhood. Slavery is still legal in America. The 13th Amendment to the Constitution that freed the slaves in America states that there shall be no slavery or no servitude in the United States or any jurisdiction thereof, except those who have been duly convicted of a crime. Do you want to be a slave? Young people, stay in school and get an education. No matter what it takes, education is the cornerstone of freedom. The dream is a nightmare when young black youth are shot down in cold blood in the streets of America, tased and choke hold to death. The dream is a nightmare when children are having children. The dream is a nightmare when adults are walking around blaming the children for their bad behavior, sagging in disrespect of themselves. I don't remember a time when I walked out the door as a young person 
And my mama didn't tell me, boy, you better be on your best behavior because you represent me. God is not pleased with us as young adults blaming the children for sagging their pants down. If you don't like the rap music, change the neighborhood from which our children are raised in because the music depicts their neighborhood. And if you don't like them sagging the pants below their waist, raise their minds and their pants will follow. The dream is a nightmare. When black people who are standing on the shoulders for their success disrespect the work of the movement and the sacrifices made for their financial gains by the lies and omission of our leaders and our contributions. I submit to you that this backbiting, jaw-dropping behavior is disrespectful to the life of Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph David Abernathy, and the Civil Rights Movement. Yes, this dream is a nightmare. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 and 8. To everything there's a season and a time for every purpose under the sun. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. This, my friends, is a time of understanding. A people who forget their past by not passing on the true history are destined to repeat it in one form or the other. We were denied our God-given rights as human beings and never equally participated economically in the American society that we built. From the time of slavery to integration, white people have had a 400-year head start economically and socially. They committed the crimes against humanity toward black people. They committed the crime but never served no time, nor paid the price for reparations to repair the conditions caused by their deliberate human deprivation and destruction. And now we stand at the dawn of a new day, the post-civil rights era. Racism is now more subtle and subliminal. America's words have changed, but slow to change is her heart. And the system is still designed to hold us down. And we live with a false sense of reality appearing real. That we have arrived when we as a people are still struggling to make the journey. The vast majority of African American people are still poor and uneducated. In reality, we live with the residual effects of slavery and segregation. I call inverted racism, where it, it has internalized itself back into the person who was oppressed in such a way that the oppressed now becomes the oppressor. This pervasive attitude is passed on from generation to generation. These effects manifest themselves in the way we treat each other. We automatically bask in the glory of our brother's downfall. We automatically are harder on one another than we are on others. We automatically are the first to criticize our people using degrading language to describe ourselves, nigger, ho, and the B word, and defend our right to do so. We feel that the white man's water is colder than ours, and we're in competition to get a taste. 
We're in a love-hate relationship with one another. If you can't say amen, say ouch. We rejoice in the accomplishments and support our people as a whole. We're so proud to say we're the first black appointed to this position, or we're the first elected to this post, or achieve a, a rank on a job, as if this is a badge of pride, when in reality, it's also a confirmation and pitiful declaration of just how far we have not come, that today we are still the first to be. And when we get into these positions, we want to treat each other like the white man treated us. We don't want to let go. We try to hold on for life, never bringing a young brother or sister up to take our place. We suffer from attention deficit syndrome. The dream is a nightmare. Now is the time to wake up out the coma and create a vision to make the dream a reality. Three quick points. Education, health and wellness, prison reformation. This current generation, our young brothers and sisters, are told to run the race of life. And when they get on the track, they realize everyone's had a 400-year head start. And the country is now moving on the superhighway of life. Good news. What used to take a year to happen now takes a day. What took a day now takes a minute, which means we can catch up, be smarter, accomplish more than ever before, in and out of the classroom. We need trade school back in the public school system. Our children need to leave high school with a diploma and an apprenticeship license for a trade. The future is moving now from racism to masquerade into classism. The have versus the have nots. Have you an education or not? Have you a trade or not? Have you a job or not? In classism, the haves will be at the top and the have-nots at the bottom. That's classism. My young brothers and sisters and their parents, focus your attention on education stay out of prison. Focus your attention on economic empowerment. Stay out of prison. Focus your attention on health and wellness. Stay out of prison. Watch what you eat. And stay away from the GMOs. Genetically modified organisms. Make up 70% of our nation's food supply. The chemicals in the food we eat. You can't pronounce the names and neither can I. The information is at your fingertips now, on your phone or your computer. Just Google GMO. The world is yours and life used to be about doing something good. Now it's about being something good. Well, if you do something good, you'll be something good. Now let's deal with this prison industrial complex. In America, 
It's not just. It's just mostly just us. How many of you all in this room have a relative or a loved one who's either in prison, out of prison, on parole or probation? Raise your hand. This is an unsettling fact among our young people. Death by each other, death by the police, or prison by the system. The judges are stiffer, and they give stiffer sentences to African Americans than they do to white Americans. The laws are tough on drug offenders in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s than in the days of prohibition. It was white collar crime then, it's black collar crime now. Once you're a convicted felon, you lose your right to vote. It's no coincidence. It was done that way on purpose. Now the Voting Rights Act doesn't apply to you. They move you to the slave plantation and you serve time in prison. The physical labor is mandatorily free to the state, as it was during the days of slavery. The mental stress fierce, and your health compromised. There is very little or no job training or skill training program in prison. You have no financial foundation to fall back on. You're just 40 years from integration and equal participation. And economically, your family is trying to make ends meet. Your baby's mama's gone. Her financial needs you can't give her in prison. And you lost your house, your apartment, your job, and everything. And by the time you get out of prison, you've probably shortened your life by five to 10 years with no skill, no job, and no education. 98% of everybody in prison does not have a high school diploma. In Georgia, you're put back on the streets with $25 and told by society to make it. This is the modern day system of genocide of the African American race and it's done by design. It's designed to keep the masses of our young African American people from the successful transferring from deprivation, poverty, and inferior education to superior education and economic empowerment. The system's not intent to catch everyone in this web of destruction. However, it's designed to get the masses of our young people who are transferring through a critical period of transfiguration. White Americans realize that they have gone through the growing pains of generational development. Black Americans are in the adolescent stages of generational development. We're just 40 years from segregation and repressive stagnation. America realizes that every race is viewed collectively and not individually. We submit to the theory, I got mine, now you get yours. And in fact, the fact that you don't have yours doesn't directly affect me. However, indirectly it does. Or else to America you'd be more than just another Negro with money. You see, we're missing the point. All men are not free until we all are free. Together we stand, a house divided will fall. We're all linked together by an inescapable chain of destiny. Black and white people work together to accomplish the successes of the civil rights movement. All white people aren't bad and all black people aren't good. 
we may have come over here on different ships, but we all rowing out the same boat now. And like the children of Israel, we'll run to, wandering around the wilderness. We've forgotten how we made it through. It's through the suffering of our past that has brought us redemption for our future. And when I think about the present state of affairs, I'm reminded of that seemingly contradictory movie, Back to the Future where a young man travels back in time to ensure the promise of the future. We've got to go back to what worked for Moses and Aaron, All right. Joshua and Joseph, yeah. David and Solomon, yeah. Elijah and Elijah, Ralph and Martin, yeah. Mama and Grandmama. Yeah. We've got to go back to God. We can't make it on our own. But he promised never to leave us. Yes, he promised never to leave us alone. In closing, I'm reminded of a story of a little boy playing with his favorite sailboat on the water. And after a while, the boat drifts beyond the little boy's reach. And so he starts throwing rocks just beyond the boat. He doesn't intend to sink the boat, but the little boy knows that with each rock upon the water, there's a ripple. And the little boy knows that the ripple made by the rock will push the boat back within his reach. Well, my friends, I stopped by here to tell you that God treats us like that little boy treated his favorite sailboat. When we get too far out beyond his reach, God, the solid rock, creates a little ripple in the sometimes tempestuous seas of life to send us sailing back within his care. So when it seems like we've forgotten where we come from, God sends a little ripple. When you hear about the Tea Party taking over Congress, don't worry, Congressman, God's just sending us a little ripple. When you hear about the repeal of the President's National Health Plan, don't worry, God's just sending us a little ripple. When you hear and see our young people being killed and shot down by each other and by others, don't worry. God's just sending us a little ripple. When it seems like we are, in as much as things seem to change, they still remain the same. Don't worry. God's just sending us a little ripple. He's calling us back within his care, back home where we belong, home where he promised never to leave us, never to leave us alone. All you got to do is just hold on. Hold on to his unchanging hand. Hold on, because truth crushed to the earth will rise again. A lie can't live forever. Hold on. How long must you hold on? How long? Not long. Till the black man stop living with a slave mentality and start loving with a God morality. How long? Not long. Till black people realize that the penal justice system it's mostly just us, and we must help our young people find their way home. How long? Not long. Soon, the bottom rail will rise to the top, and justice will roll down like a mighty stream, and righteousness like running water. How long? Not long. 
Because God's word is true. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and seek my face, turn from their wicked way, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. How long? Not long. Soon the lion will lie down with the lamb and man will turn his sword in the plowsheds and spears in the pruning hooks and study war no more. How long? Not long. For we fight not against flesh and blood, but spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the sword, which is the word of God, and your feet strive with the preparation of the gospel of peace. How long? Not long. How long? Not long. Because I've seen the lightning strike. And I've heard the thunder roll. Felt sin breakers dashing, trying to conquer my soul. But I heard the voice of Jesus being an Abernathy, fight on. Because he promised never to leave, never to leave you alone. I don't know about you this morning, but I'm standing on his promise. How long? Not long. Somebody ought to tell God, thank you. Thank you for truth. Thank you for setting the record straight. Amen. As the old folks say, you heard it straight from the horse's mouth. That's why we have to be careful of what we see and what we hear until it comes from the right source. Amen. Amen. We thank our Reverend yes. De- Ralph David Abernathy oh, yes. for yes. such an inspiring yes. inspiring message. Not only history, but also giving us hope for the future. At times like these, after hearing a word from God, perhaps today we would not want to close out without extending an invitation to discipleship. If you are here today and you feel within your heart and mind that you want to make that change in life, to become a better citizen, a better person. Now is the time to come. We will pray with you. We will counsel with you. You can always make a new star. Perhaps you've strayed away. Perhaps you've gone down the wrong path. But what a great time to make that U-turn and get on the right path. The path that leads to righteousness. The highway that leads from earth to glory. If you are here today and you desire to become a better person, will you take the time to come Don't be ashamed because all of us in this room at one point in our lives were on that downward road to destruction. But when we heard the word, 
We were convinced in our heart. Will you come just as you are? Now is the time to make that decision. To yield your life to a higher power. Who will lead, guide, and direct you on this path of life. God bless you. As we continue now in our program, well, this time we'll have our minister Gwendolyn Watts, who will come now and give our acknowledgments. And following that, we will have our guests, our elected officials. I will call your names, and you will come in that order. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. And uh, Reverend Abernathy just said that his brother is here. Brother-in-law, Sam Williams, if you're here, we want to acknowledge your presence. Amen. Amen. At this time, you'll be delighted to know that DVDs of this service yes. is available for you today. So after this service, you will be able to purchase those DVDs so that you can hear this over and over again. Amen? Because we know that if you hear it one time, you may only have light exposure. But to hear it over again, you would be able to pick up on those nuggets. And there were a lot of them. A lot of seeds that were planted on today. Amen. At this time, we would like to acknowledge uh, all of those that have come out. As Martin Luther King, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said that everybody can be great because everybody can serve. And he said that as a part of his drum major instinct speech, February 4th, 1968. And listening to Reverend Abernathy, it encouraged us to let our light shine. Amen? Amen. So we want to, on behalf of our president, the Reverend James D. Morrison, and the entire cabinet of the Baptist Ministers Conference of Greater New York and Vicinity say to you, thank you. We acknowledge each of you in your respective places for taking the time to come out and be with us on this day of celebration and commemoration and future activism, amen? So give yourself a round of applause for being in the building today. as we celebrate the life, the love, and the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, Jr. We had some visitors that may still be in the building. We want to acknowledge you all. Uh, all Souls Unitarian Church has been with us, and we'd like you to stand. We want to acknowledge your presence here. The Security Ministry of the Convent Avenue Baptist Church. If you're here, let's give them a hand. The young man, the seven-year-old young man that recited with no notes in, in our presence today. The I Have a Dream speech, young Jeremiah Chadwick, a member of the Convent Avenue Baptist Church. Amen. Captain Baker of the 30th Precinct. Amen. Our sister, Clara McCullough, who and her ushers that have, have, have been here with us all day, and she serves us every Monday that we are here at the Baptist Ministers Conference. We want to acknowledge her. We want to acknowledge Clyde Williams, former assistant to President Bill Clinton, and a member of this Harlem community. 
we want to acknowledge David Goodman of Andrew Goodman Foundation.